Okay, so moving on in the agenda, we will now uh, begin our second installment of our new business meeting feature called Sharing an Academic or Professional Experience, in which ACES student chapter members share their real world LAS related experiences. Tonight's presenter is Lauren Reed, ACES student chapter secretary, who will be sharing her experience working in the area of grant management. Lauren? Okay, well, I first I want to make sure everybody can hear me. So um, if you can either give me a smiley face or actually maybe that like really sad face because I feel like I don't see that guy enough. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I am going to talk about grant management tonight. And um, I was I first wanted to see also who's, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I was actually thinking when I was preparing things how a lot of people, even I get very frustrated, frustrated as a grant writer, and I think a lot of people's reactions to grant writing and grant management is um, usually a thumbs down. So, um, but how many people here ha have actually either written a grant or um, had anything to do with grant management? Yeah, Carletta, I I thought I remember from your bio. Um, you you manage grants, I think, for a, a public agency. Okay, Lorraine. So if I'm just going to go over some, oh, both private and public. Oh, okay, great. Um, well, I'm just going to go over. Um, I think it's pretty. I just did like a, a basic overview of grant management, and then um, you know, if anybody has any questions while I'm going through, I'll try to keep my eye on the chat box, and then, of course, at the end, you can ask questions. I thought I'd first kind of explain how I got into grant management. Um, I did my first grant while I was doing my first uh, master's. And um, we actually got the first grant I ever wrote. And so it kind of gave me the bug for doing grant writing. And um, and I really like researching. And I really, um, I really like making um, a case for why uh, funders should give us money. And I was really interested in that. So when I graduated from my master's degree, uh, in international development and global health, I continued on with grant writing. And I actually have been doing it now for a little over five years. And some of the information I'm going to give you tonight might be very much from a, a social service standpoint uh, and not as much from a library science standpoint. But I think some of it will correlate um, in terms of fundraising and um, you know, nonprofits, and I know that a lot of libraries are having to become much more competitive in getting fundraising. So anyway, um, we'll go into the presentation. So um, this is just a basic overview of the type of grants that are out there. So um, usually they're split up between public and private, and public funding, you know, is just the federal, state, um, local, um, which is county and city, and sometimes. Um, Funding is actually federal, but it gets channeled either through the state or local. So um, it can actually be money that's federal money, but it, that it's coming through um, it's coming through another um, public or, or uh, a public entity like a, a local or, or, or a city um, department. And then there's private funding, and within private funding, you have foundations and um, uh, corporate, so corporate usually a corporation will set up a foundation, or um, you also have. I didn't put this on here because I don't. Sometimes you don't write for them, you don't write grants, but you can also have trusts, and um, where people set up trusts to go towards causes that they care about. Um, you know, after you know, while they're living or after they they pass away, um, the funding will go towards a cause that they um, cared about in their life. Um, and all through this presentation, I've kind of given you a few um, humorous slides because I feel like the more you can make grant writing fun, the better it is. So I had I kind of found some good slides or some good um, comic strips for the presentation. So, um, and then I just kind of uh, thanks Frank. <laughs> and then I just kind of I wanted to give you just some basic terminology. Um, 
I think, I mean, I think this is true with most um, kind of professional worlds you get into. There's all sorts of acronyms, and then when you get into it, you realize that only, only people can really only people that are in the same industry that you're in can really understand some of those acronyms. So these are some really basic um, grant writing um, acronyms, RFP, request for funding, um, uh, NOVA, notifications of funding. And most of these, uh, the RFQ up, are, are for um, public um, grants. And most um, foundations don't use um, terminology like this um, is for really public funding. LOI um, is usually a short introduction that foundations will ask for. And it's usually one or two pages. And sometimes you don't even ask for a certain amount. You're just kind of introducing them to either your, your project or your organization. Um, a letter of support is, um, is usually an attachment that you will um, put with your proposal. And this is basically just you're getting a partner or somebody that you, another organization you work closely with. And what you'll do is you'll have them write a letter that says, you know, you support what we're doing. Um, you think that we have a really great program. Um, so sometimes those are asked in um, guidelines from um, foundations and um, public um, funders. And then a memorandum of understanding um, is just usually some type of contract um, where you're explaining what you're going to do um, with the project um, and what your partner is going to do. So there's clear guidelines about who's going to take part in doing what in either serving clients or um, so forth. And those also are usually attachments um, that are requested. Um, so um, I thought it might be good to kind of talk about where to find grants. Um, and I think, uh, you know, one that a lot of people go to is a funding, fundraising, fundraising database. And the only one that I've really used in my last three grant writing jobs has been the foundation directory. And um, I don't know if anybody here has used the foundation directory. Does anybody use the foundation directory? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and it's just, it's really, it's a great database. I mean, you can put in, um, say you're in California, you can put in California. Um, you can look up uh, different types of programs, and there's hundreds of hundreds. So you could look up library science. Um, you could look up homelessness. And it will pull every foundation that has given towards that cause. Um, you can also look it up the opposite way where you can look up grants. You can say, I want to look at grants in California that have been given towards homelessness. So you'll actually see not the foundation, but you'll see $40,000 went to XYZ organization um, in 2005. Where do you get access to this bat database? Yeah, it's online um, and it costs money. I don't actually know how how much it costs. I know there's different levels. Oh yeah, Carletta, I don't know how much it costs um, because I don't usually do billing. <laughs> I just use it. Um, but I know there's different levels. Um, and I've, I've usually had the very high access level. And they do, they'll do like grids. So you can go into a foundation and you can um, grid out like say they've given to a lot of different causes and you can say show me a graph bar or a, a bar graph of, of all the different type of funds they've given and it will show say childcare and then it will show um, homelessness and you can press on those graphs and it will open up all the different grants by um, like who they've given to and in which year. It's really cool. It really breaks down some really interesting stuff, yeah. Um, but I would actually be careful with these databases because sometimes the information isn't up to date and I would always go to their website and, and it links it on this database. If they have a website, it's probably 100% of the time it's, it, they're going to link, they're going to link that for you. So you could, I would go straight to their database um, because they're mostly pulling things from their 990s and that's not always um, as up to date as you'd like it to be. Um, and then I, 
I read Chronicles of Philanthropy. Um, I try to every day um, as much as I can. And other publications that have to do with fundraising. Um, oh, Lorraine, you you uh, you read that too? It's really interesting. It um, to kind of see what there's a lot of. Yeah, I read it all the time. Yeah, there's really it's it's a great way to keep your pulse on kind of what's happening in the nonprofit world and with fundraising. Oh, bye, Suzanne. Thanks for coming. Um, and then, uh, and I just give an example of another one that I kind of got introduced to last month, but I haven't used it that much. And this one, this one costs. Chronicles of Philanthropy, you can get some of the articles, but there's actually a membership cost. But you, you can get, um, I, I don't know, about half of the articles on there, so it's not restricted. And then CD Publications pulls together um, different grants, different types of grants as well. And then similar organizations, um, this is basically mining for information in um, similar organizations' annual reports. So we have, like, we have a organization that works with pregnant and parenting teens at uh, the place that I work. So I'll go into an organization that works with um, young teens. And I'll look at who's funded them because a lot of times they thank their funders in their annual reports. And then I will then go to their websites and start looking at them. So that's a really great way to um, figure out who's funding in the category that you're interested in. And then Foundations 990s. Okay, so I don't know if a lot of people have used GuideStar. Um, it's actually, it's Okay, Mandy. Okay, Carletta. Okay, so some people have. It's free. Um, you just set up an account. And uh, I think there is um, some level, higher levels of account access, but you have to pay for that. But just the basic account, you can get into any uh, nonprofit or foundation's 990s. And this is, and I'm going to show you in a, a further slide, this is a really great way to see um, so for instance, if you look at a foundation that says, oh, they support um, libraries, um, and then you go into their 990s, and you can get a better idea sometimes in their 990s um, who, what kind of programs they support. Because sometimes they'll give you more, more information, like, okay, they support libraries, but only they support, it looks like they only support children's programs. So you can really get um, specific sometimes in their 990s, and that will help you um, not waste time if you don't think they're a good match, because you're, you're always trying to figure out if you can match their um, interests with your interests. Oh, Charity Navigator. Yeah, it's been a while since I've, I've looked at Charity Navigator. I think that's the one where they grade you, right? They, they grade different um, charities um, looking at their um, they're like financial statements and stuff like that. If I is that right, Lorraine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a really great that's a really great um, tool for if you want to give to a charity. I think as well um, to look at kind of how they've gotten graded and how well they um, they keep their financial books and stuff like that. Um, and then. Um, Public funding listservs and websites and databases. So this is kind of tricky. Um, a lot of so right now I'm I'm on several different um, public funding listservs and what that means is that, for instance, I got on Sacramento um, their actual website and you have to find. Um, the uh, sign up to get on their listserv. And sometimes that's easy. I mean, grants.gov is the biggest one. And that's, you know, you just get on grants.gov, look to get onto the listserv for all their different grants. Sometimes it's tricky um, when you get to like county levels and city levels. Some, some are really like on top of it and it's easy. Some of them don't have listservs at all. You have to go to their website. So you, I like what I do is that I create a folder, a bookmarked folder that's like, you know, um, websites, grant website, public grant websites I check every week. Um, and then some, um, for example, in San Francisco um, has uh, one RFP page where they post um, a lot of the um, city and county uh, grants 
that have come out, but you, it's like you have to keep checking it and looking at it. So sometimes it's easy, the information comes to you, and sometimes you have to go find it, and you have to kind of learn how each one does it differently, because they all do it differently, um, if that makes sense. So this is an example of a 990, and this is for the, um, who is it? I'm going blank. It's a huge foundation um, that I did. Um, I just grabbed one um, that I found in the um, guide star. And this, I, I wanted to pull this just to give you an example. I know it's kind of not quite as clear, and I'm sorry, guys. Um, but you can kind of get an idea of, OK, so this foundation gave to the Rural, uh, uh, Rural uh, Innovations Network, AKA Village Innovations. And then you can look over here and you can see, okay, this is the date the grant was given. This is the amount, 223,000. And then you can see really what the purpose of the grant was. And this is what I was talking about. Like you can think the foundation is giving in an area um, that you work in, so you can think, oh, okay, well, they, it says they give to homelessness on the foundation directory. But then when you look in to actually what the purpose of those grants were, you sometimes get a better idea of, of really what they want to fund. Um, um, you know, I think they're, Chris, I think they're all different. And, I, and, and that's going to go into another slide where Always contact them, especially uh, foundations, because you just don't know sometimes. You really just don't know sometimes. And sometimes there's information that they don't give until you call them. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure if they do that deliberately. Maybe some of them do. Um, but maybe some of them, they're not doing that very deliberately. But that's a really good question. Sorry, guys. So um, I just kind of want to talk about some of the differences between foundation and, and um, government or public funding. Um, basically, with foundations, well, you normally treat like more like an individual major donor. So you're not, and this goes to the second point, you're kind of addressing more of like their, their mission and their values um, because they were probably set up with a real driven purpose to address a certain issue um, and so you, you, you don't, you don't want to push a relationship on them but you want to try to cultivate a relationship so if you get, if you get to talk to a program officer you want to really um, get a good communication going um, and really kind of address what their interests are. Um, and you want to try to match, of course, your interests. You know, you don't want to be um, uh, misleading about what you're doing just to fit their interests. But you, you want to keep in mind that they have their own mission and their own goals as well. And the difference with that with government funding is that, um, you know, in, uh, government funding, you're going to get um, the RFP, and it's going to tell you exactly what they want and exactly what they're looking for, um, and you're going to get graded, and you're going to have a really clear idea. Like, they're going to give you 15 points for writing a really good um, program description. They're going to give you 15 points for talking about um, the qualifications of your staff. So you're going to know, all right, this is what they want. This can be very clearly defined what they're going to fund. And then you're going to know how the people grading the proposal are going to grade it. And they're very careful about that. And, and I think there's a real um, uh, care to be fair because you know, that can always be contested, where with a foundation, there's no grading. You know, you're just, you're, you're writing this, their board is looking at it, they're going to discuss if it matches their goals, and then they're either going to fund you or they're not. But sometimes you won't know, and usually you won't know why, because it's, it's a little bit nebulous and it's not on a graded point like government funding is. I hope that makes sense, um, what I'm saying. You know, not, hopefully I'm not being too vague. Um, that makes sense. Okay, good. <laughs> Yay. Um, and then, like I said before, and this kind of speaks, oh, it does, good, Frank. Um, and this speaks to Chris's um, question, always with foundations, um, call them, contact them. Um, I didn't do that for a while. I didn't contact them. I just 
wrote proposals, and I would get no, no, no. And as soon as I started calling them, and they just hear my voice, and even if I, I've even had it where I don't even talk to anybody, I just leave a message on the answering machine, it really, it really helps. It's about relationships. Yes, that's right. It is all about relationships. Um, and then be aware, um, be aware of their guidelines, and this goes back to don't always trust things on the databases. Look at their websites if they have a website. Um, sometimes they'll change guidelines. I've had um, a foundation actually change their guideline halfway between like a week before the submission, and I almost hyperventilated because I had almost written the whole thing, and I was like, what did you do? Um, thankfully, they just let me turn it in, but it's really good to keep an eye on um, what they're really asking for. And then be aware of unsolicited because a lot of foundations, and I'm I'm finding this to be true. I, I I'd be interested to hear like um, Carletta or Lorraine if you see this as well. But I am seeing a lot of foundations turning towards um, not accepting unsolicited proposals, and that might be because their money is very tight, um, and it has been for a while, and they they want to close their funding to only those organizations that they've funded in the past. I've heard that a lot. And um, so if they don't accept unsolicited, don't write to them. It, that's from my experience. I don't, I don't, I don't try to um, push that envelope. If you know somebody, who's, know somebody who's on their board or you can create a relationship, that's good. But um, I try to respect that. Yeah, exactly. I, d I do too. Um, yeah, and I've never actually tried to not do insults, and I just respect that they, they don't want you to write them. Um, um, and then this is just an idea of tailoring to their level of communication. I have some foundations that really um, want um, want a lot of communication, some do not. Um, and I think that's just gauge, gauging their kind of their level of interest and their time. Um, so just being aware of that. With government funding, you're you're not gonna there's no creating relationships. Um, um, you you're gonna have a certain amount of time to a certain date that you can ask questions um, for an RFP or and after that you don't communicate with anyone because they're really trying to be fair and um, grade the proposals fairly. Um, and then uh, another difference, I'll just throw this out here really quickly, is that um, for, for a lot of organizations, government funding can be very tricky because a lot of public funding um, requires matching money. So as much as the, um, the RFP or the, um, the funding stream will give you, you have to match that amount either with um, cash or with in-kind. And it, it differs by each um, funding stream. But that can get really tricky because um, organizations are left trying to make up that matching amount with a public grant. So I think that that's something that's really good for organizations to keep in mind when you're taking on a public, um, public funding stream. And then I would say the challenge with foundations is that a lot of, found not all, but a lot of foundations like um, to fund things that are exciting and they're new and and they're thinking about how you're always improving and which is good, but it's also sometimes like the staff hasn't changed, you know, you don't want to move to another program when, you know, you want to sustain the program you have. So sustainability is really an issue when it comes to um, foundation funding because you could have a long time um, foundation fund you and that's really great, but you know what, you never know. And that's why it's good to diversify as much of your funding as possible um, going outside of grants. Um, and so anyway, yes, going on. So I'm just going to talk about this really quickly. Um, I, the organization I'm working for now is really fun because I'm starting to get into more um, program development discussions. And it's neat being the grant writer because you're kind of like, you get to see a lot of stuff in an organization, like how people bring together programs. And you get to work with you know, the division directors. And um, it's actually really fun in, in this kind of you know, you're at the hub of where things are sometimes getting started. So um, the larger foundations, I would say, and, um, and then public funding will a lot of times ask for a logic model. And I'm in 204 right now. So you probably, everyone's probably read about a logic model if you've taken 204. And this is just um, 
um, something to help you think about um, the program development, like what's the situation, what's the problem, or what's the issue that we're addressing, um, and then what are you going to put into the program, um, staff, volunteer, time, money, um, and then um, what are you going to do? That's your output. That's your activities. Who's going to participate in it? And then your outcomes. I mean, what are you really trying to achieve? Um, and I'm going to go to the next slide because this actually gives an example um, of a logic model that um, I thought it, it's sometimes it's hard to see like you know these really vague terms and then you're like, well, how does this work? And then you know this kind of might help a little bit to kind of see um, this example of underage drinking. Um, Buffalo County faces um, prevalent use, uh, alcohol use, and then it talks about what they're putting into their program, uh, what they're going to do in terms of their prevention education programs. Um, who they're looking at to participate in, under the outputs under participation, and then and then you have your short, medium, and long outcomes. And can I just say I love this. Um, I have this up in my office. This little clip on the side, if everyone can see it. So this guy is it's like a professor or something. He, he's like showing the grid from one of the other, and then it says, then a miracle occurs, and then it says below, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. And I think that that's um, I think that's probably the challenge. I know, isn't that awesome? I love this clip because I think this really speaks to the challenge of, of program development and really making the case of what you're doing. There's always these very grand ideas, which is great. Um, you know, it's why we're usually in social service agencies because we, we want to make really great changes in the world for the better. But sometimes these details are what kind of gets um, left out and kind of the steps that we're taking to reach, you know, our outcomes and then ultimately to, to meet the, the organization's mission. Um, and then I just want to talk really quickly about SMART objectives um, because a lot of um, a lot of grants will ask for you to um, establish objectives and these um, I think this is, this is also in 204, um, if people remember this. So specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. Um, and then the two different type of objectives, the process objective, which basically is just saying um, you know, how many people are going to serve and just a general idea of what you're going to do. And then the impact objective is the one that's really been, um, uh, and when I've gone to training, especially when I first started grant writing, this was really pressed upon me. Like you need to show, um, you're taking people or a program or a project from point A to point B and your impact objective is really what you're saying you're going to do. How are you going to improve people's lives How, in coming from a social service with, um, with um, people who are homeless and low income? Like, what are the, the, the how are they going to improve and by what percentage is usually what it's put in there's other ways to to um to um, determine that and then how are you going to um track that and evaluate it so uh, and then let's see. I went to this really great training. If anybody's in Southern California, it's called the Executive Service Corps of Southern California. And um, and this guy just kind of I took from one of the slides um, that he had about fundraising myths that I thought might be interesting to kind of go over. One is um, we're a nonprofit. We're not supposed to make money, um, which is a a misperception by a lot of people that that you are. Um, Tax deductible uh, nonprofit means you don't have a profit, and that's actually not what it means. It means that that's the tax bracket that you're under. I mean, I'm sure most of you guys know that, but I think the general public doesn't. That um, it has nothing to do with profit. It has to do with the fact that you don't get taxed, and then you know when you give money to them, you also get to take the deduction from your taxes. So I think that that's a, I think that's really a common myth, probably with the public. Um, special events are the best way to make money. Um, I don't do special, I mean I've been involved with special events, but I think that this is very true in a lot of um, organizations that you think special events is going to bring in all this money, it's actually extremely labor intensive on your staff. Um, it can uh, cost more money than what it is. Yeah, it costs more than um, to have them, that's right. And um, <laughs> I didn't see your, thanks Carlette, I'm happy you're enjoying the cartoons. Um, and 
but really it's about soliciting, um, getting people involved in the organization. And this is the main thing this guy told me that I really, um, really held on to. And that is, your organization was set up for a reason, and that core reason was to provide some type of service in the community. And the community starting probably came together to start that. So what you want to do with events, for example, is that you want to get that community engaged. And that is really um, the core of, of how um, fundraising should be approached, is that it's about getting people um, to recognize that you, your mission matches their values. Um, and so this is what he's talking about, the way to pull them in and then you know, following through with people who have come to the event. Um, we need a whole uh, bunch of new contributors. Another idea that um, is a lot of times wrong because um, you know that's not really addressing cultivation. So looking at the people who are actually um, funding you, um, that's called like the low hanging fruit. And these are the people who you know you don't know. You just, just recognizing what they give and seeing if they can give a little more. That's a way to um, do um, really great fundraising because you already have them um, invested in your organization. And then we have fundraising staff. They should just do their jobs. This speaks more to like board members. Um, you know, that, that the idea is that everybody, whether you're a volunteer, whether you're a member, whether you're a board member, should be involved in cultivating um, the community to give to the organization in whatever way they can. And specifically, this is talking about fundraising. And then all we need are a, huge, uh, a few huge grants. Again, this is a sustainability issue because, um, you know, grants usually are just for a year, and you don't know if they're going to give those to you for the next year. So um, you need to really look at, like, your own personal finances. You need to look at diversifying. And then let's see. So I don't, I haven't done a library grant uh, for a library information science organization. So I just put these up because, and I just did a general search and tried to find things. The first one is the foundation center. So for you guys that are interested in that, um, uh, the foundation directory is what I was talking about, the database. I'm sorry, guys. The foundation directory is the database for searching. The foundation center is actually a, um, a fundraising center um, that actually has free um, classes and webinars on fundraising. I don't think they're all free, but some of them are. And I believe they're all over the country. I know they're here in San Francisco, but I think they're in other places as well. So if you guys want to check them out, um, I haven't spent as much time looking at them, but I really want to because I think they're just a wealth of information. And then these are a couple other places. Um, FYI, Laura Bush's Library Foundation, they actually um, uh, announced a grant today. So I don't know if anybody works for a library, um, but you might want to look at that. Um, that came out on grants.gov um, just today. Um, and then TechSoup, um, I actually work for, a, I'm actually volunteering with another organization. And we're looking at TechSoup. And TechSoup is, um, a tech, I don't know if anybody knows TechSoup. Um, but they're actually um, an organization that um, works to help nonprofits um, get really affordable software. And um, I actually know somebody that works with them. I'm not quite, I'm not like really well versed in what they do, but I'm starting to look at them for another organization I'm working with to get them a um, donor database. And it's supposed to be really affordable for 501c3s. Okay. And then, Questions. And can I say this picture actually came from a grant writing website and I thought it was hilarious because I have to say this is how I feel the majority of the time. Um, I actually felt this way today because I have a grant to do on Monday which is stressing me out. So anyway, I'm going to open this up for if anybody has any questions. Oh, your company. Oh, the corporate website. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. Oh, that's great. Is my hair as cool? No, no way. I wish I could do my hair like that. I've always wanted to do it. I don't, yeah, I don't even know how I would, but I wish it was that cool. Lots of roller, yes, and probably sleeping on them as well, right? That would be, <laughs> that would be miserable. Oh, somebody has a question here. I'm going to give up the mic and Frank. <clears throat> Not so much a question, but a comment. Uh, 
I recently toured the California Academy of Science here in San Francisco, uh, the Natural History Museum, and uh, was given a tour of uh, the library and the archive by uh, the two librarians on staff. Uh, one was a kind of a more traditional librarian and one was an archivist. And they both said that they uh, spend a significant amount of their time doing grant writing. I think um, they get a lot of funding for uh, projects, special projects they do, uh, you know, archiving collections, doing finding aids for collections, a lot of digitization. Um, so anyhow, it seems like, you know, and you hear this all the time that grant writing is uh, is becoming um, is a good is a great skill to have. So it was really interesting to hear this talk and. Um, think about how uh, we could uh, take this into the library world. That's a really great um, that's a really great um, point, Frank. And you know i'm I'm more of the um, I've worked mostly in um, organizations that work with um, social service uh, for um, human services. And I think that that that's been a, a, a an industry that's relied very heavily on grants for a long time. So it would be interesting to know like if it's increased. I'm guessing it has. And I remember I talked to an archivist uh, with this uh, San Francisco Public Library, and she said that um, you know going into archives because it's something that I'm really interested in. She said uh, you've got to be prepared for taking on um, positions that are just grant funded, so they're only going to last for a year or two. And kind of acknowledging that it's going to be very grant driven, um, getting um, some of the projects that you get. So at least that's what she told me, and that's very true. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any other um, questions? Okay, I'll pass the mic to Sarah. Lauren, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Wow. Grant management is much more than I ever knew, and I now had we've all now had a great introduction to your talk. Does anyone else have any further questions for Lauren about grant management? So mine is more a kind of a comment. Lauren, I really like your uh, color choice for the slides. It fitted in so well with your theme. And all those cool cartoons you have. So what do you do? Do you collect them in a database and pick one as you uh, see fit when you're making these presentations? You know, I have actually never um, presented about grants before, so I I hope it wasn't too scattered all the information because no, never. I ne I never talk. I never really talk to people about grants, probably because they don't want to talk about it. But um, oh good, oh oh good. I'm happy because you never know. You're like out here in space talking. Um, though the you know. I found that one with the um, that I pointed out that I really really like um, about like a miracle happens, and um, like I said, I have that in my office. And while I was actually doing the slides a couple days ago, and I was like, I wonder if I can find any other really good cartoons, and I found um, quite a few. So now I have them collected, and um, I should put them all over my desk so they will make me very happy while I'm very stressed. <laughs> but thanks for the thanks for the comments. I'm I'm happy that um the the that you enjoyed the slides. It actually was quite a, a saga to get them um up, but I, great. I'm happy that it was um aesthetically pleasing. Lauren, considering I need this less and to eliminate, I would think uh, I must say you presented like a pro. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, I'll echo that, Lauren. Your presentation was very professional and well done. Your slides were beautiful. And um, like I said before, we've all learned so much about grant management tonight from listening to you. Personally, I did not know anything about this topic. So this was a fantastic introduction. And it's been so interesting listening to you talk about your experiences in this area. 
A last call for questions. Are there any other people who would like to ask Lauren a question while she's here and ready to answer them? I'll just grab the mic. Uh, yeah, I just had another quick question. The uh, and I'm, I think you may have touched on this uh, in your presentation, Lauren. But uh, for someone who's not taking a formal grant writing class, and I think uh, the, uh, there's actually a course like that at SLIS, one of the seminar courses. Maybe uh, I think they have some a class in grant writing. But if we don't take a, a course in grant writing. Um, do you have any um, resources uh, you could recommend for how to sort of um, uh, get get trained or, or get some training or either self motivated or some webinars you could take online? Um, so I would first look at this foundation center. Um, I flipped back to this slide. I would check them out. You know. And I was actually going to mention this, and I, I didn't mention it, but I was going to mention it earlier. I, grant writing is a funny um, skill because um, as far as I know, there's no type of degree. And I actually took a um, fundraising class when I was in grad school, um, but we looked at all the different types of fundraising. And it was just one class. And um, I would say um, there's a lot of Local places will have like um, uh, you know like one or two day um, sessions, and that's a really great way to get like the basics of um, looking at guidelines and stuff like that. But um, but it's a lot of my experience has just been from um, just doing it, and and I, I definitely think there's a skill to how you write. I mean, you're trying to make a case, but I also think like being just a really great writer and paying attention to the guidelines because um, that's the tricky thing, like making sure you're really addressing what they're interested in. So, um, so first I'd say the Foundation Center, and that might give you a really great place if you're looking for like more formal um, um, training. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, Lorraine, did you, you want to ask something or, or, or say something to Frank? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I took a grant writing class when I was getting, um, I went to community college and I took a certificate program. Um, they used to have it at SDSU and then they moved it down into San Diego City, San Diego Mesa College. Anyway, they had a grant writing program. Check out your local community college, you might find one there. Um, what I did was I used it and I got a job as a, a tech writer. I did some proposal work for commercial um, proposals for a company. Thank you, Lorraine, for your comment. Lauren, do you have any last um, words you'd like to say? Um, hmm. I guess not. I guess, um, I don't know, if you ever get to writing a grant, like, I, I think just knowing that you, being um, a student and, and being somebody who's gone through your program, you've probably got some really great skills, writing skills, and um, I think sometimes it seems like a more daunting thing that, than it is, um, although sometimes it is more daunting than you will think it will be, but I think I think sometimes it, it gets pumped up as this big thing, and I think that you know, as long as you can really make the case and you're passionate about what you're doing and um, are thoughtful about um, answering the questions, I think everybody can do a really great job grant writing. So that's it. Okay, thank you, Lauren, for your great presentation and. Um, for answering questions and thank you to everyone who who participated in the Q&A session. We've learned so much from listening to Lauren's presentation tonight about grant writing. And with that, uh, I would like to just say a few words before closing. Um, I hope to see everyone next month at our uh, student chapter events and our October student chapter business meeting. Like Frank said, we will be having a faculty prime time 
event on October 5th featuring Dr. Judy Weedman, and we'll be having a uh, ACES panel composed of three uh, SLIS faculty speakers later in October, most likely, uh, speaking about their experiences attending the uh, ACES National Conference this month, uh, in October, as well as providing an introduction to the ACES organization. And then at the end of October, we will have another business meeting. The date is yet to be determined. And at that meeting, we will be uh, including another one of these great sharing and academic or professional experience uh, feature presentations by one of our ACES student chapter members. So we look forward to seeing you next month at our events and meetings. Um, also, if anyone who attended tonight uh, is interested in joining the student chapter and is not yet a member, Patricia, our uh, membership director has volunteered to stay after the meeting and speak with anyone willing to um, who, speak with anyone who has questions about perhaps joining our student chapter. And um, with that, I will say thank you all to attend for attending our student chapter business meeting tonight. And good night.